Komodo dragon. The name conjures images of fire-breathing creatures of myth and legend. But they're real monsters. Growing up to three meters in length and up to 90 kilograms, the Komodo dragon is the largest living lizard on the planet, and they're the apex predator on their islands. When I was a child, I was fascinated by Komodo dragons. But if you'd asked me, as a graduate student in chemistry, whether I would ever be researching them, I would have surely said no. But today, I'm here because my research indeed involves studying the blood of Komodo dragons. We're interested in Komodo dragons because they are, while they're predators, they're not above taking advantage of easy meals, including carrion, which is less than freshly killed. They'll eat everything. They eat the hooves, the, the fur, and the bones. But the only thing they don't eat is the contents of the intestines, the poop. And they'll eat up to 80% of their body weight in a single feeding. A study in 2010, looking at wild dragons, identified 58 different bacterial strains in the mouths and the saliva of these wild dragons, the majority of which were predicted to be potentially pathogenic, causing disease. But the dragons themselves are unfazed by the bacteria in their saliva. This is despite the fact that many dragons have bleeding gums and they inflict bite wounds on each other, suggesting that Komodo dragons have evolved a robust immune system, one that protects them from the bacteria they carry with them and the bacteria in their environment. And my question is, is how can we harness this information to benefit humanity? And why do we need this information? Antimicrobial resistance and the emergence of multi-drug and extreme drug-resistant bacteria threatens the utility of existing antibiotics, which are the cornerstone of modern medicine. Almost every aspect of modern therapy depends on the availability of effective antibiotics to prevent or treat infection. This includes the treatment of simple scratches and cuts, childbirth, surgery, and chemotherapy we list a few. Antimicrobial resistance will impact almost all aspects of modern medical care unless we come up with new antibiotics. And hence, there's an urgent need for such new antibiotics. My collaborators and I believe that we can learn a lot from studying animals and, the immune, and their immune response in protecting against infection, the mechanisms and the molecules they produce to protect themselves from pathogenic bacteria. We feel that the, the understanding these systems can help provide inspiration for the development of new antibiotics and new therapeutic strategies. A peptide is essentially a small protein, which pro these are molecules assembled from amino acids, much like beads on a necklace. And it's those amino acids that make up the proteins and peptides that define the properties of the, pe of the protein or peptide. Antimicrobial peptides are fundamental elements of innate immunity. And innate immunity is that front line of defense against infection in higher organisms, including you and I and Komodo dragons. It is a highly adaptive immune system, evolutionarily speaking, to environmental challenge. And antimicrobial peptides show extreme diversity in their structure, their composition, their mechanism, and the regulation. Antimicrobial peptides can serve a variety of capacities in immunity. They can act directly on bacteria, exerting an antibacterial effect. They can also act on the host, modulating the immune response to exposure to pathogen and modulating inflammation. Moreover, many peptides exhibit antiviral, antifungal, and antitumor properties. Thus, in antimicrobial peptides, nature has explored a diversity of molecules that we would find difficult to replicate in the laboratory. Moreover, we don't even fully understand the rules that govern the evolution of these molecules and what makes a good antimicrobial peptide as a functioning in the body. My collaborators and I, when we set on this project, we realized we needed to develop a new process, a new approach to discovering peptides. We developed a process in which we were governed by two overriding rules, two overriding principles. One, we do not fully understand the complexity and diversity of peptides that are out there, their composition, their function, their regulation, and their origin. And second, that these peptides may be present in extremely low abundance in complex solutions. 
complex samples, such as plasma. Plasma is the fluid that is left behind when you separate the cells from blood. Plasma is extremely complex, comprised of low molecular weight, small peptides that can be extremely diverse, and you've got large proteins and larger peptides, and when you look at the sample, these peptides that we're really interested may be in, present in very low abundance, whereas the majority of the molecules in the sample are these large proteins, these large peptides, that really are not very interesting to us. So identifying and discovering these peptides in such a complex mixture is challenging. An example, or a good example or analogy or situation is to look at New York City. New York City has about 8 million people, right? actually 8.5 or 8.6 million. So if we think of those people as peptides, the types of things we're really interested in analyzing, if we were trying to look through this and sift through this complex mixture, these buildings, and everything that makes up New York City, and trying to analyze the people and identify a specific subset of people, such as, let's say, New York Yankees fans. So our New York Yankees fans are like our antimicrobial peptides. If we're trying to find them in this complex environment that is New York City, it would be a daunting task, much less, I would argue, potentially impossible. Unless we found a way of bringing them out, those Yankees fans, and concentrating them in a single location, such as Yankee Stadium on game day. Right? The baseball game, the Yankees playing, whatever team they're playing, provides a bait to draw out those Yankees fans and bring them out to the stadium. Now, we've got other fans there, too, general baseball fans. You've got fans for the other team. And you've got a whole range of Yankees fans there, the diehard fans as well as the casual fans. But that's what we're trying to capture in our analysis. We're trying to find this diversity that's there. So we have developed an approach where we've developed a process that harvests these antimicrobial peptides from these, the serum and plasma and these complex mixtures by targeting and focusing on the fundamental principles that we understand about antimicrobial peptides. What do we know about them? What do we know about their properties? And we made baits to draw them out and capture them. Now, with our, through our process, we can capture and enrich and harvest those peptides we're interested in and using some advanced analytical techniques that are very sensitive um, and very precise, we're able not only to detect the peptides that we've captured, but we're also able to determine their composition, right? And now that we have that composition, it's just data. We have the com amino acid composition that makes up those peptides, and it's just data. And we, with that information, we can chemically synthesize the peptides in the laboratory. And this is significant, because this means, this means we don't have to keep going back to the animals to get more peptide. At this point, we can synthesize it as we need it to evaluate those peptides and determine if they are indeed antimicrobial and if they have any therapeutic potential. Remember, our focus is, is developing new therapeutics. We've applied this process to study predominantly large reptiles, uh, crocodilians such as the American alligator and the saltwater crocodile, and yes, the Komodo dragon, as shown here. In fact, this is our donor. In these analyses, we've, sequen we've captured and sequenced thousands of peptides. And from those, we've identified hundreds that are, we predict are potentially antimicrobial. And these are peptides that are never before seen before, and most of them don't resemble ones that are known, to, known before we did these studies. We've chemically synthesized over 100 of these peptides and evaluated their performance. And through these testing, by initially testing against are they antimicrobial, and then taking them through more rigorous testing, we've identified multiple peptides that show broad spectrum antimicrobial activity. By that we mean the peptides are capable of exerting an antimicrobial effect. They're effective against multiple strains of bacteria, and including antimicrobial resistant strains. Remember, that's important because that was one of our primary reasons for why we need these new drugs is antimicrobial resistance. And we have identified peptides that are indeed effective against those bacteria in the laboratory. But interestingly, our analyses of Komodo dragon identified a short peptide that showed some very interesting antimicrobial and potential wound healing properties. So we chemically synthesized a derivative of that peptide, a version of it, that shows very promising wound healing properties. In that study, this small synthetic peptide shows complex behavior. It accelerates the rate of healing and rate of clearance of infections you can see up here faster than wounds that are untreated 
as well as wounds that are treated with another peptide called LL37. That's a peptide produced by you and me and every human in here. And it's a peptide that's known to have wound healing properties and a peptide that's known to have antibacterial properties. Yet in both capacities, Dragon 1 shows superior behavior. And Dragon 1 is a fraction of the size of L37. It, and as I mentioned, it shows a complex behavior. It exerts this effect. It has this wound healing property and the infection clearance properties, not only by targeting the bacteria and helping to clear the infection, but it also appears to affect the host cells, the animal cells, to stimulate and accelerate the closure of the wound. Through these analyses, we realize, we come to realize that the diversity of molecules available in serum and plasma and other biological samples is far more complex than we anticipated at the outs outset of the project. And as such, we've begun developing new technologies and improving our existing process in order, in order to more effectively analyze those peptides to identify and detect those peptides which we, which we are currently cannot do. But we believe that they're there already based on some other data that we have that suggests that they are. And these peptides also have potential therapeutic utility. But we're not just interested in therapeutics necessarily. We're expanding the scope of our studies to look at new species um, to better understand their immune systems, the peptides they produce, and what stimulates the production of them, the regulation of the immune response in these animals. I envision a future where we and others start applying a similar approach, an approach where we go in with very few preconceived notions in to analyze the peptides that are available, available in nature, to look at the diversity of peptides that are out there to identify new bioactive peptides for therapeutic and other applications. And beyond that, to capture the diversity of molecules to better human health and improve our understanding of the world around us. Thank you.